So without further ado, it's my honor to introduce the real hero of the Mayor's Alabama, Captain Richard Phillips. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a tough act to follow Hollywood. <laughs> but I'll try and do as, do as I can. It was hot. I, I, I was nervous. Heck, I, I was scared. I, I really didn't know how it was all going to turn out. But enough about my wedding day. <laughs> Let's get what you brought me here to discuss. I guess I've always been a, a little bit different. For, for many of those who choose a career or life at sea, it's a legacy handed down from, through the generations from grandfather to father to son or daughter. For me, it started not, not in a ship, but rather in a cab. In our time to, together today, I get a chance to share with you an extraordinary experience that affected my life, and we can examine how the lessons I learned in a unique, unique, unique situation can have an impact on, on us personally and professionally. But first, let, let me give you a little bit about my background. When I graduated Winchester High School in uh, Winchester, Mass. in 1973, I wasn't like a lot of kids today who, who, knew, uh, who knew what they wanted to do. I graduated high school and I, I took a bunch of different jobs. One of those jobs was driving a cab in, in Arlington, Massachusetts. One day I was coming back from Logan Airport. I was driving back through the back door, Chelsea, uh, not the best neighborhood. I know that because I lived there later. Uh, and this guy hailed, hailed me over. I'm driving by, I pulled over, picked him up. He was wearing a leather coat, collared, button-down shirt, shined leather shoes, and pressed dungarees that impressed me in 1975, so I, I picked him up. He got in the cab, and I asked him, where, where do you want to go? And he said, I want some action. And I said, uh, what kind of action are you looking for? And he said, uh, I'm looking for broads, and I'm looking for booze. Uh, I, I had taken him to the combat zone, the red light district in Boston. I don't recall how I knew where it was. Probably one of my friends told me. <laughs> it was only 10 o'clock in the morning, so I started talking to him. <laughs> and I asked him, well, what do you do? And he says, oh, I'm a merchant mariner. And I said, what's that? And he said, oh, I, I'm a seaman. I, I work on ships. And I asked him, that sounds interesting. Do you like it? And he says, oh, yeah, I like it. When we arrived at the combat zone, when he gave me a $5 tip for a mere $5 fare, it beget yet another question for me. How would someone like me get involved in the Merchant Marine? He gave me an address. I, I rode away to it, but I, but I never heard back from him. A few months later, my brother Michael was, went down to Massachusetts Maritime Academy. He, he, had, he was just getting out of high school. And he told me that, you know, they don't really shave your head when you go there. Uh, you don't really have to wear uniforms all the time or, or suffer the discipline and endure the discipline of a Navy enlistee do during, during basic training. So I enrolled. Upon entry into the academy, I, I learned many, many things. But the, the first thing I learned that my brother thought lying to me was funny. <laughs> However, with much shorter hair and significantly more discipline, I took to the sea for the first time, and uh, I knew that I was hooked, that that's what I wanted to do. I, spent, and I graduated in 1979, and I spent the next 12 years on various types of ships, gaining the experience and taking the tests necessary to raise my license to an unlimited United States Coast Guard captain's license. In 1991, I became a captain. Like a lot of captains, I work 90 days on a ship and then, and then spend 90 days at home. As you can imagine, this, this creates quite a different home life than many of my neighbors or indeed many of most of you. For example, how many have you, you, have you said to your spouses, honey, we gotta make a decision here. I, I gotta go back to work in December. Or when I go to work, I hand my wife a honey-do list 
And when I return, she gives it back to me with more on it. <laughs> of course, it does have its advantages. While many people deal every day with uh, rush hour traffic, morning and afternoon, all I have to do is climb a ladder or roll out of the rack, and I'm, I'm at the office. Now, as many as you know, uh, you know about my background, so let, let me share with the three major points I'd like to talk about today. They're not just based on my experience with pirates, but also from my being a floating CEO, if you will, of a 17,000 ton ship navigating highly changing seas with a varied and diverse crew. The three points I want you to know are, one, you are much stronger than even you know. Second, the only time that all is lost is, is when we choose to give up. And third, a dedicated, motivated professional team can overcome most any obstacles or solve most any problem. Let's go ahead and, and begin our voyage. Uh, I had left Burlington, Vermont, uh, and then I flew to Washington, D.C., then over to Amsterdam, down to Dubai, United Arab Emirates, over to Muscat, Oman, and 39 hours later, I ended up in Salala, Oman. Many people asked me if, if there was anything different about this voyage of the, of the many of the multitudes of trips I've taken through the years. And while I was leaving to go to sea, uh, my wife was taking me to the airport. She's an emergency room nurse, and she was running late. So when she took me to the airport, she actually just dropped me off in front, and we said our goodbyes there. It was the only time that we didn't actually walk into the terminal or, uh, or the security station and, and say our goodbyes. Don't get me wrong, I, I don't think this had anything to do with what happened later uh, in the voyage. <laughs> However, part of my extraordinary motivation uh, to motivation to survive at a later point was based on my belief that my wife would continue to say to herself, why didn't I walk, walk him in to the security station as, as I've always done? I was worried that she would play that casual moment infinitely in her mind if I didn't make it back. Well, after flying halfway around the globe, I joined the crew of the Mask Alabama in Salal Oman on March 31st. I went through all the procedures normal in the turning over of a ship from one captain to another, and then we got underway for Djibouti. During the first full working day, I really focused on one of the main things I think a successful leader must do, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. As a leader, I'm not really interested in seeing any one of my team fail, but I certainly want to, if we, may, if we are going to be unsuccessful, I certainly want to be while we're in a practice or training situation rather than while the real situation is facing us. When things are going just fine, it's certainly easy on a ship to do what we call become fat, dumb, and happy. Back on the ship, pirate activity in our area was on the rise. I had always told my crew, it, it, it's not a, a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And the cavalry wasn't going to be able to ride to our rescue, but I, I thought we could handle it if we trained, if we were prepared, if we planned for the worst. One of the first things I noticed when I took over the ship was that security was, was kind of lax when I got on, so I decided after a couple days that we'd have an unannounced uh, security drill at 9 in the morning. As a captain, I'm only required to do these quarterly, as, though, as I said, it's better to plan for the worst. As a captain, I also believe it's highly important to be creative in these situations. Training gets you through what you've experienced before. Creative approaches and imaginations will get you prepared for what you have yet to experience. At 9 a.m., I'm on the bridge and announce to the bridge team that there's a small boat 100 yards away with four armed men coming at us in a hostile manner. That drill lasted about 10 minutes in a critique where everybody gets together and discusses uh, what went on and problems they had lasted about three times that long. When we found problems, as, as we did a after every drill, some, some people didn't know the signal for a security alarm or a pirate attack. Doors that should have been locked, like the doors to the engine room, weren't. People didn't know our code words or our non duress passwords. And we also generated other ideas, like we did at every critique, and one of them was a backup safety room, which came into play in this very incident. 
Anyway, we talked it through, and we all sort of got on the same page. Well, everybody but, everybody but this guy, I'll call, I'll call Cliff. Cliff, who, who never did get with the program. Remember Cliff on Cheers? The, the guy with many years of experience and vast arcane knowledge, but little wisdom or common sense. There, there's one in every organization. I, I had one on my ship. And there was some grumbling about the drill and training, isn't that way, the way it is about all our training? But a few days later, everybody in the crew was real happy we'd taken the time and planned for the worst. Now, picture, if you will, the, the vastness of the sea in the darkness of that very night, and a voice coming over our ship's radio saying, Somali pirates coming to get you. Somali pirates coming to get you. This is what we heard the night before the incident. The next morning, about 0645, one of the crew on the bridge spots a boat, a thin wooden boat with a high-powered motor on the back, a stern of us about three miles, coming on fast, about 20, 21 knots. We changed course. They changed course. We maneuvered, and they married and did that same identical maneuver. It's pretty obvious what is happening here. We're in the area of the Indian Ocean where other ships have been taken and hijacked. The ships have been held for ransom, and the crews have been held as hostages and some tragically killed. We understand the severity of the situation, and the mood of my crew ranges from highly concerned to blatantly terrified. We get on the ship's satellite telephone, which we learn later is basically an apartment in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, with three British guys manning the phone. You call them and they call somebody else who calls somebody else a piracy clearinghouse, if you will. <laughs> the three British guys provide us with lots of great advice. We have someone with AK-47s bearing down on us, closing. And they're asking questions like, are, are you sure it's not a fishing boat? <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, un unless they're shooting the fish, probably not. <laughs> now the pirates are two miles away. We start getting our flares out, ensuring the doors are locked down, starting to account for some of the crew. By the time they are one mile away, most of the crew is up. We sound the alarm. We got this crew positioned to get to the muster room and back to the safe room at a half mile away. We get the flares ready and the fire hoses are charged and flowing over the side. The pirates keep coming closer. The third mate starts shooting flares at the boat trying to give them a problem, perhaps catch the boat on fire and pretty soon I'm shooting flares at the boat also hoping to give them a problem. Earlier I mentioned that one of the three points is that you are stronger than even you know, and it's at this part of my adventure with these pirates that it first came into play. You see, now the pirates are shooting at us, and I can hear the ping, ping, ping. It's the pirates' bullets making dents and ricocheting off the stack in the side of the hull. Now my training as a merchant marine officer, as opposed to someone, say, in the military, wasn't didn't really include dodging bullets from semiotic weapons fired from, by pirates. However, as I discovered firsthand, when faced with a threatening situation, somewhere within us we find the strength to do what must be done. And while I was the one who had to realize it on that day, I'm just as confident that you would have and could have done exactly the same. On the ship, we continue evasive maneuvers, but we can't shake them. They come up alongside about a ship. One of the guy in the boats is firing his AK-47 up at me on the bridge wing as I'm shooting flares down at him, trying to give him a hard time, when another pirate in the boat grabs a ladder, picks it up, puts it onto the side of the ship, and starts climbing onto our ship. By this time, it's just me, the third mate, and another sailor on the bridge. Thanks to our planning, most of the rest of the crew is hidden below in the safe room. The chief engineer and engine crew are hidden in the engine control room and after steering where they can take control of the ship by bypassing the bridge controls. And because of our training and drills that we talked about earlier, the doors that should have been locked are locked. We've prepared for the worst and while the yet has yet to happen, we're, we're as ready as we can be. One by one, the four Somali pirates climb aboard the Maersk, Alabama. I don't know if they all plan to come on our ship as they were designing their missions. My guess is they failed to exercise the precise procedures that we had. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty certain that they had not gone through significant training. 
for their mission. I know this because their boat got damaged and overturned. They lost their ladder when they boarded us, and the boat and the ladder started sinking pretty rapidly. You don't have to be a sailor to know that a sinking boat is never a positive development on the high seas. <laughs> However, now the four Somali pirates are all aboard the Mask Alabama, and they have no way off our ship. Their boat is sunk. I believe this has made them even more desperate. And this began a slippery slope for the next 12 hours of tension, stress, hide and seek, cat and mouse, and Simon Says on a 508 foot ship. And unfortunately, we have become a part of history. At this instant, I'm the captain of the first United States ship attacked and boarded by pirates since the 1800s, and I do not consider this a good thing. <laughs> In spite of all, of all this, I've got to say the pirates were a happy group at first. Why? They learned we were a United States ship. And they even started high-fiving each other on the bridge because they thought they were going to get a big payday from a rich American steamship company. At least, that's what they thought. At sea, we can never count on anyone riding to the rescue. At sea, you can't pass the buck. Unless you yourself take action, a fire can be a disaster. A deep laceration can be a death sentence. A storm can be a catastrophe. You've got to be able to take emergencies head on, whether it's a broken bone or a pirate attack. The pirates were happy, were happy at first, like I said, and they made nice with us, but they soon discovered they, they had this one big problem. There were only three of us on the bridge with them, the four pirates, me, the third mate, and a sailor, and they couldn't find anybody else. And the mask Alabama was now no longer moving, it was drifting. They told me to make the ship go. I, I told them I can't make it go. They started to get mad. Make the ship go or we'll shoot you and the crew. I say, I can't because you broke it. I had to be strong enough to convince them that their problems were their fault, not mine. They're, they're getting madder. Where's the crew? Where's the crew? They constantly queried me. And I'd answer, I, I don't know. I'm here with you. I don't know where they are. Then it was, order the crew to come up here to the bridge now or we'll shoot you and the two crew. I did what I was told, thanks to the security drill, though. The crew was aware of the safe or non-duress password. In other words, unless I said this safe word in my orders or direction or instructions, everybody in the crew knew to stay in hiding. Uh, like a playing an adult game, as Simon says. Well, almost everybody knew. <laughs> there was a knock, knock, knock on the, on the bridge door. Remember Cliff? <laughs> the guy who never gets the memo? So now there's four guys with the four pirates on the bridge of Mask, Alabama. After a while, the pirates have me lead them through the ship looking for the crew on four different occasions. They constantly ask me, where are they? Where are they? And we'd go through the ship. We, we'd go through rooms and see cupboards and uh, uh, blankets thrown on the deck. We'd see clothes hurriedly thrown on the deck. We'd go through the galley and we'd see the coffee made, the bacon already made, uh, the melons cut. Uh, it was really a Marie Celeste moment. And they constantly asked me, where is the crew? Where is the crew? I, said, I don't know. I'm, I'm here with you. Then they take one of my sailors with, the, with one of the pirates to go find the crew. Once the pirate and the sailor uh, go down below, my sailor takes them to the engine room, and my crew and the sailor take responsibility. They take action, and they take him as a hostage, the leader. So now there are just three pirates on the bridge with two, two of my crew and me. This dance goes on for about 12 hours. They threaten. They demand information. I keep saying, I don't know. I'm here with you. I don't know where they are. They keep getting more and more worried about the pirate, the leader, who's gone, and the mask Alabama keeps drifting. Throughout this whole process, I'm very clear about my responsibility. Protect my crew, my ship, and cargo. I'm trying to figure out ways to do just that. As I discover strength in me that I really wasn't certain I had, and as I grow in pride about my crew and the strength and resistance that they are displaying. So we keep talking, the pirates, the crew, and I, and we keep talking and talking, and we finally come up with a solution. We'll help them get, get on to our rescue boat since they sank their boat when they boarded. Then we'll give them back their guy for me, and all four of them can steam off to Somalia. As it turned out, our rescue boat broke down, so that's how we wound up getting on a lifeboat. 
Now, this is the part of my talk where I have the pleasure of clearing up one of the biggest things the media got wrong. I didn't surrender myself as a hostage, some kind of sacrificial, heroic, fatted calf. I believe that my major responsibility was to get these pirates off the ship. I knew if I went with them, they, they could never get back on the Mask Alabama. They had lost their boat and their ladder. And that would mean that my crew, the ship, my cargo, my responsibility, would be free and clear. In spite of everything that I had learned in my training as a captain, that I should have been the last person off the ship, I believe that that was the best way that I could protect my crew, my ship, my cargo, and ironically myself. The best thing I could do was get these pirates off the Mask Alabama. Somehow I, I knew that was the best course of action. The fact is, without the assistance of one crew member to get the boat into the water, they couldn't leave the ship. I decided that that crew member would be me. The deal was I would get them underway, we'd get off the ship, and then we'd go back to the ship and exchange their missing fourth guy, the, the guy they actually have in Terre Haute, Indiana prison right now, the leader, and we'd return him for me. We'd all agree that their attempt had failed and we'd make the exchange. In all, in all honesty, I knew there, there would be a chance that they might not let me go, but I'd, then I'd only be responsible for, for one guy, me, instead of all my crew. And I've always considered myself a lucky guy, not especially intelligent, brave, or, or any of all that, but I liked the odds with just me. So for me to leave my ship and to get on that lifeboat with the pirates wasn't surrender, nor was it something that, that I view as a, an act of heroism. It was my strategy my action plan, it, it was my duty. And that's the way it played out. I helped them get off the Mask Alabama, they got their missing guy back, their leader, and then they didn't let me go. It's, uh, it's another lesson I learned, never trust a pirate. <laughs> yeah, it was a disappointment, no one would want to be adrift with four armed pirates in the Indian Ocean and an enclosed lifeboat. But uh, I've got to say, I, I love seeing the expression on these pirates' faces when the, when the crew that they couldn't find were now yelling at them from the main deck and talking to them over the radio. The ship that never worked was now steaming, uh, exhaust was spewing out of the stack, lights started coming on the Mask Alabama, and, when they, and the ship was now following us in the lifeboats. To say the least, the pirates weren't happy, and, and they would take their displeasure out on me. However, my ship, my crew, my ship, was safe. So that's how I wound up on the lifeboat with the pirates. The, the configuration of the lifeboat is a center aisle with two seats on each side. It's fully enclosed uh, with a hatch on the after end, a vertical hatch, and on the forward end was a, a horizontal hatch similar to a sailboat hatch. And on, on the top was the coxswain area, control area, where, uh, where you would steer the boat. Uh, it is uh, uh, basically up by the four windows. The majority of the time, the pirates would have two guys by that stern vertical door with guns watching me. There'd be one on the forward end by the forward hatch, and then there'd be one up in the coxswain or the uh, control area operating the lifeboat, steering the uh, lifeboat. They all, they all just spent their time watching me. They had radio so, so they could talk to the Mask Alabama and later to the Navy when the Navy showed up. One other important thing, it was unbearably, indescribably hot. And in many ways, that was the hardest thing for me anything more than about 80 degrees and I'm hurting. Uh, I, li I liken it to spending 12 to 15 hours a day in a sauna. After the first day, the pirates had knocked out two of the windows, but it still didn't get much, much cooler in there. I was also convinced that there was no way the Navy was going to ride to the rescue. I, I did the mental math and figured they were, they were just too far away. However, I vowed I, I would not give up. If I gave up, I realized that I truly just became nothing but a hostage, just something they could ransom for money or murder for notoriety. If I didn't give up, I, I could play mind games with them as they were playing with me, just uh, so I would remain their adversary instead of a hostage or a passenger. I, I thought I might be able to create a way to escape. I knew the Mask Alabama was going to trail us for a while, so I had told the chief mate over the radio, if you see a splash, that's me coming out the back door, come and get me. As it turned out, I, I had to be flexible. I, I didn't get a chance to get away that first day. I had to be flexible, refuse to give up, and wait until early in the morning of the April 10th. At about 
One or two in the morning, one of the pirates by the stern door got up, walked forward, and lied down by the forward end of the boat. Pretty soon I could hear what I think was two people snoring on the forward end of the boat. The guy who was in the coxswain area, the control area, he's the leader, he's sort of dozing and nodding like he's had a bad movie. I'm, I'm thinking I can get by him. I'm trying to be flexible. All of a sudden, the lone pirate by the aft door gets up and he goes out of the hatch and he stands on a little platform on the after end of the boat. And I'm thinking, what in the world is he doing? Perhaps some of you can have already guessed it. Even pirates have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> but, but for me, there was one lucky fact in his call of nature. There's really no delicate or refined way to explain it, but this pirate is one of those guys who uses two hands. So that was very important to me. It meant he had to put the gun down. <laughs> Two sleeping, one dozing and nodding, one heeding nature's call. Well, I know I'm not going to get a better chance, so I flex my legs, I stand up, I take two strides out, I get by the guy in a coxswain position, I go out the hatch, I push the guy who, who, who's out on the after hatch, had to do it twice, and he goes into the water screaming. I turn around and dive in and swim away. Unfortunately, his screams awoke in the other three pirates, and they could see me by the light of the full moon, so they came after me in the boat. I dive under the water and actually go under the lifeboat and try and come up away from them. I then would sit there in the water and just listen to their footsteps and yelling. I could hear them on the deck, running around the deck trying to find me. It's, it's hard to see someone on a boat because you're basically right underneath them. So I would hear their footsteps and yelling. I'd dive back under and go to another, another place away from them. I'm trying to listen to the footsteps, and about the fourth time I dive under and I come back on the other side of the boat when unfortunately there was one with an AK-47 right there. He fired once and I made a quick adjustment and remained flexible and said, okay, okay, you got me. <laughs> they took me back on board and, and they were not happy. Punches and slaps to the head, whacking me with a pistol, hitting me and trussing me up so tight, so tight today that I still have some scars and numbness today. Yelling and screaming, yeah, they, they, they were irate. But it's amazing what happens when you, when you refuse to give up. I, I don't know why it works that way. I just know that it does. When you vow you won't quit, sooner or later something will happen to make your situation better. For not long prior to my ill-fated escape attempt was about the time the Navy showed up flash, with flashing lights, blowing sirens, lights and planes overhead, surprised the heck out of me and probably the pirates too. And from that point on, the pirates were in constant contact with the Navy. I assume they were negotiating, but I really didn't know anything that was going on in that regard. It, it was good to see the Navy boats come alongside to check out the lifeboat. But I was still stuck in stifling heat with my hands bound so tight they were swelling up like balloons and four guys with guns on me. It, it was the night the Navy got there that the atmosphere in the lifeboat drastically changed. The pirates, in a display of their Muslim faith, started incantations back and forth to each other. Then the leader gave a gun to one of his guys and said, you do it. The guy went behind me, and the next thing I know, I heard a, a bang, or sh I thought it was a shot, and I could feel blood coming down my head, but I'm alive. Later they told me, oh, well, we didn't shoot you, we just hit you in the head with a gun. I said, oh, well, thanks guys, that's much better. From then on, I, I knew that whenever the hatch closed, uh, something bad was going to happen. And the way I survived that was by meeting yet another and sometimes most important challenge of any leader is remaining calm. I don't think anyone ever solved a crisis at sea by losing their wits, so I had a lot of practice remaining calm. It seems that sometimes people assume the, uh, the Attitude necessary for never giving up means some kind of wildly enthusiastic behavior, but I don't think you can persevere when you're panicked. I worked at staying calm when the pirates staged that scene with the ritual incant incantations and a guy with a gun on my head two more times. I know now they were trying to, but they were trying to mess with my mind, pl play with my mind, uh, playing mind games and trying to control me, trying to get me to give in, resign my position as their adversary and truly become nothing but their hostage. During the last session, the guy sat behind me, pointed the gun on my head, and the gun went click, 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 click. I lost count after about 75 times and this seemed to go on for about three hours. During this incident, I finally yelled at them, hey, 
Would you idiots get someone back there who can shoot that damn thing? <laughs> it may all have been mind games, but at the time I did assume that they were going to kill me. There was a part of me that didn't see a good outcome and the possibility of dying was, was there. So at times I, I had a chance and I would form uh, on a structural member in the lifeboat, it formed a cross, and I would focus on that. I settled my affairs in my mind. I went through the memories of my family. I said something to my wife, my son, my daughter. And I always said that if I could look back and, and look at my life and laugh, that would be a sign of a good life. And while I believed I had been blessed with a good life already, I would, would have preferred a different ending. I realized that, that I never prayed for rescue. Uh, I, instead, I prayed for the strength and patience. I asked God to give me the strength and patience to deal with the situation as best I could. And that I would have the strength to never give up, for as long as you don't give up, you, you still have a chance. When you're trying to stay calm, a, a little faith does help. The fake executions were just one of the things they did to mess with my mind. They spent untold hours upon hours having me tie and untie knots. They constantly were reminding me that American sailors were vastly inferior to Somali ones. And they would even remind me that my family would miss me when I died as, as if it was a foregone conclusion. They even told me that they were actually working for the United States Navy uh, and also for my company and, and they were just testing my security. And we even had this conversation about how when we arrived in Somalia, they would take me to the movies and, and have me meet one of their girlfriend's moms. It all made me a little mad, and it also made me even more determined not to give in and not give them the pleasure of seeing me give in. So I'd play with them too. I could not, would not give up, and as long as I was in the game, I, I thought I had a chance. This went on for an intense heat for three more days. My world was pretty much what I could see out that aft hatch and what was inside the lifeboat. I could see the Navy presence through that aft hatch, and they came by in boats a few times to eye me for signs of life, give us some batteries, give us some water and food. I could hear the helicopters overhead and even catch glimpses of them through the overhead windows. And as the, as the days passed, I could see the pirates were starting to get tense. The Navy presence, I think, was starting to spook them. I, I think that's why the leader, the, the guy they have in prison now, decided to leave. He was the smartest guy, and he had somehow figured the odds had changed against him. He had bailed on his buddies, given up and quit, I think. Obviously, there was a lot going on I didn't know. I didn't know anything about the negotiations between the Navy and the pirates. And I knew the U.S. Bay and Bridge had taken the vessel under tow, but I didn't know, know why. I just knew, I just knew all I would do is I wasn't going to give up. I was troubled that my wife would always regret that she didn't drop me off at the, uh, at the security station instead of walking me inside. I just vowed I would never give up. I might die on that boat, but it would be because the pirates had taken my life, not because I was going to quit and give it in. The three pirates remaining on the lifeboat were wondering about the leader, who they believed was still negotiating on the Navy, Navy ship. But by Easter Sunday, I was really sick of all the pirates' crap. I had gotten badly dehydrated, dehydrated that day. They even started giving me water again. I drank about a gallon of water and I was starting to feel better. They untied my wrist for the first time since my failed escape attempt and I started to get feelings in my hands. I undid the bindings on my feet and then I stood up and told them I could not and would not take them anymore. I was going to jump in the water to get cool. They started shouting at me, sit down, get in your seat, sit down. I said, uh, I'm out of here, and then I gave them very basic instructions on what they could do to themselves. <laughs> one pirate grabbed my waist, the other grabbed a leg. I took one, maybe two steps forward in the lifeboat, when all of a sudden, the, the young pirate with the wild Charlie Manson eyes, I call him, fired a shot into the air. I, I, I knew the sound of an AK-47 very well by now. It's impossible to describe how loud that is in a small and closed lifeboat. And I stopped, as they told me, and sat back down. However, I think that shot also scared the other pirates as much as it scared me. The two guys in front started yelling at the guy in back, what did you do? What did you do? We heard a voice from the Navy say, what's going on in there? See, they were worried about the Navy, how they would react to the shot. You see, if I was killed, I was their shield as well as their hostage. If I was killed, there was nothing to keep the Navy from storming the lifeboat and killing them. As long as I was alive, however, they believed the United States government would do absolutely nothing.
I was still drained and I'm still fed up, so I actually turned around in the center aisle and I was going to lie, lie down. I'm facing forward in the lifeboat as I see the two of the pirates to go up, go up stick their heads up the, the forward hatch to allay the Navy. And, they, and they, they stood up and said, okay, okay, no problem, no problem. At the same time, the third guy went back to the coxswain area and he's by the windows sitting in the coxswain area. That's when I heard the shots and I dived, dived down as low as I could go. Basically, uh, what, I, what I thought was going on was I thought it was a, a tough Sunday that we had in the ship on the lifeboat, and I thought they were shooting at each other from each end of the lifeboat. So I have my head down, I'm yelling, what the heck are you guys doing? There, there, there was a bunch of shots, not just the three that you heard about. The, one of the SEALs told me later that they kept firing in the lifeboat to make sure that the uh, pirates w would, not, would not get to me. They knew where I sat when they came by to eye me for signs of life, and I stayed in that seat. So they knew exactly where I was, and they shot around me. It seemed like it went on for a long time, but it was probably only one or two seconds. I got debris, debris sprayed my face when it started. The pirate in the coxswain seat, when I picked my head back up, the pirate was on, on the deck, and he was taking his, his last gas. I knew he didn't have long, but uh, you could tell he, he was on his way out. And then... There was just silence. After days of constant taunting, heat and torture, there, there was just nothing. Finally, a voice says, are you all right? It's an American voice. And then he came down from the forward hatch. It was a U.S. Navy SEAL who slid down the tow rope to come to my rescue. Even then, it really, really wasn't until I was in the Navy rib boat alongside the Bainbridge being hoisted up to the main deck that I realized, hey, I'm out of there. I'm safe. I'm alive. I made it. And the real heroes of this story are those Navy SEALs who risk their lives to, to save mine. The dedication they have to one another and the precision with which they execute their missions proves beyond any doubt that a dedicated, motivated, professional team can overcome or solve most any problem. We have things in common, you and I. We both constantly face challenge and change. Whether it's on the seas I encounter as the captain of the ship, with the changing seas of business and economy, we're all riding on ever-changing waves. And let me tell you from experience, you're, you're better off to face that with a well-trained, committed crew than all by yourself alone. Let's face it, there's only one simple reason that I'm here today, enable me to continue to live, to share time with my family and friends, for the great privilege of addressing you, a team of dedicated professionals who did did what it took to get the job done. And this has an important lesson for all of us. These aren't easy times. They're tough. They're challenging and they're changing. Yet I have a faith in you. See, I know from experience that you are stronger than you realize. And if you commit yourself to see it through, to not surrender in the face of adversity, and to unite with your colleagues as a dedicated team, then you too can overcome any obstacle you face. If you just do as the old poet said, when you're up against a trouble, meet it squarely face to face, lift your chin, set your shoulders, plant your feet and take a brace. When it's vain to, to try to dodge it, do the best that you can do. You may fail, but you may conquer, see it through. Black may be the clouds about you, and your future may seem grim, but don't let your nerves desert you, keep yourself in fighting trim. The worst is bound to happen, in spite of all that you can do. Running from it will not save you, see it through. Even hope may seem but futile when with troubles you're beset. But remember, you're facing just what other people met. You may fail, but fall still fighting. Don't give up whatever you do. Eyes front, head high to the finish. See it through. Thank you, and may God bless you with calm and prosperous seas. Thank you. Thank you.